Welcome to the 119th episode of Nerd of Another Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we are covering shows that aired during week three of the winter 2020 season. As always, we include timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and podcast feed if you only want to hear about one or two specific shows, since we are a super big spoiler podcast. Get used to it. My name is Leo, and I have been inspired to grow a humongous beard that flows like a lion's mane so I can attract an entire pack of lionesses to my pride. Then I'm going to sick them on Beacom while I chase after a sexy slime girl. You son also of a with bitch. me, RB Common Cat. <laughs> hey, <sighs> what is it with you and slime, Leo? It just it I, just gets everywhere, doesn't I, it? I will pass on the slime girls, and as I told you before the podcast, I hate animal parts <laughs> on the girls. Whenever they give them cat ears or a tail, I'm like, I'm fucking <laughs> out. But well, well, this know, season that, of anime that lioness, is not for you. <laughs> that lioness <laughs> harm in the show we're going to talk about later. I might have to make an exception. <laughs> yeah, they are all pretty fucking hot. But I will say, I agree with you, Leo. Technically, like, cat ear girls have four fucking ears, and that's weird. That should not well, be a thing. But they usually hide them under their hair in anime, so you can't, you don't even have to think about well, it. Like, the human like, ears. They're there! You know are. they, they are. there, though? You never know. You it's know like Schrod- Schrodinger's cat girl ears. <laughs> they're oh, not God. seen until they're observed. As you listeners can tell, cat is packed full of energy, so why don't you Holy tell us about shit. your nonsense? I took... <laughs> Uh, I okay. I drank a few of these bangs, and I was like, "These don't work well for me." Whatever. I tried a new flavor today. This flavor, for whatever reason, is amazing. It's called birthday cake. I want everyone to know: <laughs> if you want to die, then drink it. Um, birthday cake energy drinks. What does the world come to? <laughs> uh, well, they make birthday cake vodka, so I um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, I hate birthday cake vodka. All right, so this weekend. Basically, I took um, one of my former coworkers who used to work at, with me at the audit firm. She was really mm. stressed out about busy season. I know she's into similar shit as me. Took her to a BDSM place. She lasted like five minutes. She went and puked her guts out in the bathroom and cried about <laughs> fucking bank reconciliations while I held See, her hair. That's, and that's exactly what my experience would be if I went to one of those places. <laughs> Like, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I feel that bad was fun. No, yeah, I mean, she needed it. You know, sometimes you just need to like that purge, and then the next day you'll feel better because you like released all those negative emo- emotions. <laughs> and that's what that night did for her. She released all of her ne- negative emotions and her stomach contents. So. <laughs> oh my god. Nice. Well, oh, you're what such about a you, good, Leo? What good are you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the games that came with the Game Pass I got just the other week is Age of Wonders Planetfall. And oh, yeah. basically, if you ever played Civ Six or any of the Civilizations, Woo! and you like them, you're going to love Age of Wonders. It's almost it's a it's a futuristic setting. Uh, there's three races, like humans, bug, and then this this dwarf race, I guess. And it's like just almost exactly the same. Like there's like you need to do like treaties and peace offerings and you go to war and you even got the tech tree and you got to you can do trades. And I mean, it's almost Mm -hmm. exactly the same in that aspect. But what I found really cool that set us apart is that the battle system is completely different. So in like Civ, like you you would pick your guy and you'd say, go here and attack this. And that's the end of it. Right. Well, in this one, you kind of form uh, squads or platoons of like. Uh, six different types and then when you fight something Mm. you go into it would almost be like a turn-based battle system in like a final fantasy or something like that but you go in there and all your guys are pretty unique like you got your melee characters you got your characters that can shoot far you got uh snipers that if they the enemy moves in a line of sight they'll take a shot uh, one of the guys I had, can, he can like fortify the area and kind of like hold it down better than most people. Uh, lots and lots of different crazy abilities. And especially when you start getting deep into the tech tree and then you put mods on these guys and make mm-hmm. them do things differently or change their damage type, which some people are more susceptible to a certain kind, depending on who you're playing against. Like, like the battle system is so in depth that like I, it, that really sucked me in. And then, like I said, the rest of it is pretty much just a Civ game. It's and that's why I got uh, a hold of UBCOM after I played like two days yeah. of it. I was like, 
I know you liked Civ Six. I saw you played it a whole bunch. I was like, you really yeah. need, you really need to go check this one out because it is, it's awesome. <laughs> that sounds really interesting to me because I also I love Civ, but I also really like the Total War series. But the thing with Total War is I really like um, the simulation of like the map mode and like moving guys, moving armies around, doing all of like the management stuff, and then like I don't always play the fights because they take twenty minutes at a time. So to have something that's in between the units just animating and attacking each other in Civ and the battle instantly being over and the 20 minutes of like or to 40 minutes of battle in Total no, War the fights sounds are not, nice. No, they're not that long. They're Yeah, like something that's in between those two is what that sounds great that's to me. Pretty like much, it's pretty yeah. much, yeah, is what I'd say it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah, so I downloaded it on PC. I'm definitely going to try it out and I'll yeah, get and back honestly, to Honestly, like it's a game you sound like you really want to play on a computer with keyboard and mouse, but I've been <laughs> playing on the Xbox and it's been working really well with a controller. I was nice, relatively surprised. I didn't really expect that with these kind of games. Yeah, yeah, works. I wouldn't expect it either. I always play like 4X games on computer, but they've been porting more and more of them to consoles. Like Civ has had several console versions and iPad versions, stuff like that. Yeah. Hmm. iPad would be interesting. Huh. Yeah, I, th- I heard it runs okay. It, Civ is such a resource-intensive game that I worry about playing it on anything but a powerful PC. But uh, yeah. I, I will say, and like I said, I'm playing on an Xbox One X on with a s- external solid state drive. But like, when, if I go, if I start the game up and I go to load a game, it's almost instantaneous. It all loads up. And then also, when like you go into a battle, it's almost instantaneous too. You you can you couldn't like look away and look back and it, the battle's already starting like it's super super quick there's never a dull moment even when you you finally end your turn i think the longest i've seen it go is like 6 seconds mhm like it does it super super quick so oh, okay, there cool. there's no downtime you're constantly you're just you get really sucked in there's no you know 20 second load screen where you kind of just let your eyes wander away for a minute. Oh, okay, cool. That's one of the really nice things about it, too. Nice. What about you, Become? Uh, so I finally got around to watching one of the big movies from 2018, uh, A Star is Born. Uh, the one that's with Bradley Cooper, where he plays this sort of aging country music singer. Uh, and then he meets a young Lady Gaga, who he basically turns into a star. Uh, after discovering that she's a really good songwriter and she's got a really great voice. Um, And the whole movie is mostly them going back and forth, like performing, uh, and then their relationship sort of breaking down as she becomes more famous and he becomes more over the hill. Yeah, drunk, Drunk over the hill, drug addict. And fucked up. Yeah. yeah. No, you're late to that movie. That movie's been out for a while. Um, That's a good movie, though. It is really fucking good, and partially because, well, mostly, I would say, because Lady Gaga sings the fuck out of that movie. Lady like, Lady Gaga can shit. fucking sing. People don't <laughs> give her enough credit. Yeah. Um, I love that song she does in that, like, I'm on the deep end. Oh, yeah, when I'm, I'm diving. diving. Oh, God, it's a great song. Yeah. Yeah, did no, did do you, you know if do you know if she wrote the songs or if somebody else wrote the songs for them because they're so good? <laughs> oh, they, someone else wrote it for them. Okay, okay. Like, I know that she usually has a hand in like what she wants, but yeah. she's not like talented like that. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, I also really liked the appearance of Dave Chappelle in that movie for a couple minutes, where he basically sits Bradley Cooper's character down and tells him about. Like life and <laughs> and it sounds like Dave Chappelle is just like basically talking from his own personal experience in life. And it, it was really interesting actually. I, I liked that a lot. That um, is interesting. My favorite part of that whole fucking movie is when she wins that award mm-hmm. and she goes up on stage and does he follow her or does she take him? I can't remember. Well, she's taking him by the hand, but he's drunk out of his mind and then he falls on like the stairs of the stage like fucking, I don't know. And it's, he no, sits he, there he, and he then he sits, tries to get back up on stage because yes. he doesn't know what's happening. And then he pisses himself. Yeah. He pees himself <laughs> in front of everyone. 
It just it was it was epic in its I, terribleness. I literally could not watch that moment. I had I was looking away from the screen because <laughs> I was so uncomfortable. It's, it's imagining that moment that. where it's it's the peak cringe, and you're oh. just like, oh, and it, it hurts. It, it hurts, hurts so, so bad. bad. <laughs> also, I was like, I was just impressed with how Bradley Cooper made his voice so low for that part. Like, I don't know what he was doing, but, like, it's a much lower voice than he typically speaks with. Like, it was pretty impressive. But, uh, yeah, really good movie. Um, I guess I'll talk, like, for two seconds about Star Trek Picard, which I'm watching, because I'm only four episodes in. Uh, I just want to say, that that show curses way too fucking much. <laughs> oh, really? For, it's just, yeah. like... It's just, huh. they just throw the f-bomb around in star trek for like for no reason like honestly for no reason it never adds anything it just always cringy whenever they use it because you don't expect that from star trek it's just not what star trek is at all uh, and not that star trek is not like violent or doesn't have adult themes in the older shows but it's something that like a preteen easily could watch and not be not think that they're or their parents wouldn't think like, oh, you shouldn't be watching this. Whereas like people now, like if they saw their kids watching this Star Trek, they'd be like, whoa, what, what the hell? This is not for kids. And it just seems so stupid to make a Star Trek show that can't be seen by, by almost everyone. Because up until now, I, I feel like Star Trek has almost always been something that can be seen by almost anybody. Even some of the action movies that are newer, I still feel like most people can watch it when they're young and be like totally fine. But this stuff is just aimed at this weird older audience and it's just not Star Trek and I don't like it basically, <laughs> but I'm, I'm still watching it every week with my friend and we're just kind of laughing at it and having a good time, but it's, yeah, I wish it was better basically. <sighs> okay. Makes me okay. sad. Anyway, we Makes should be sad for you. Yeah. All right. You guys want to talk about some anime? All right. Yeah. Yes. Bore us with your fucking Chihai Afaru bullshit. Yeah. Go be calm. Kick it off with Chihai Afaru. I have, a, I have a question for you guys halfway through the episode, so get ready for that. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Episode 15, as helpless autumn leaves are caught against the flow. Um, so Chihai is still totally mind blown that Arata confessed his love to her. And so at the next Karata meeting... There's this weird, awkward moment where uh, Samire gets really worried that Kana is going to tell Taichi that Arata confessed. And she pulls Kana out of the room and is like, what are you going to do? Are you going to tell him? What, what's going to happen? Like, we can't do this. And Kana's like, I don't really want to butt in. But also, I wish there was some way for Taichi to find out naturally because he would want to know and he would probably try harder to get Chihaya if he knew. And of course, Sumire, who's in love with Taichi, is like, we can't tell him. We shouldn't tell him. Um, because if Chihaya dates Ar Arata, that just clears the way for her to swoop in on Taichi. So she's kind of invested in Taichi not finding out. Um, meanwhile, with all this, Desk Tomu is just like, you guys are really distracting me from studying, you know? Um, but he's also thinking about how he wants to set a personal goal for him self that if he reaches number one like academically in the class which would mean beating out tai chi which he's never done before uh he'll uh confess his own feelings for kana which is something to kind of look forward to um but he also just he's kind of scared of making this like the only way he can uh, confess to kana because he worries that he'll never pass tai chi and then he'll just be stuck uh so that was kind of funny uh, and then Ch Chihaya is out in the hallway, right? And she's looking at this pregnant pigeon that's outside the window. <laughs> it's such a weird scene. <laughs> she's just like staring at it with googly eyes. And Kana comes up to her. And the whole thing is that Chihaya's whole reaction to this pigeon reminds Kana of the 43rd poem from the 100 poems, the Hyakunin issue. Which is, it, the poem goes like this. When I compare my heart from before we met to after we made love i know oh. i yeah i know i had not yet grasped the pain of loving you uh so kana's mom has like a, a certain idea about this poem kana's mom felt that like yes while it was about a tryst between two lovers it had a deeper meaning about how sometimes life altering events happen to you like kana's mother's uh 
when she was told that she was first pregnant with Kana, uh, knew that her life had changed forever. And so she views this in this, uh, like, window and this lens of being having become pregnant, which is inter- an interesting way to view the poem because it's totally not what the poem uh, is necessarily about. Yeah. yeah, no, that's weird. It's. I think it was like a bit of a stretch because like when I was reading... Uh, Peter McMillan is one of the big translators of these hundred poems and I have his book on it and like he basically says this is a morning after poem uh, meaning that in the Heian period in Japan when you would bed down with a noble woman you were expected even if you didn't like her and didn't mean to continue the relationship beyond that one night to write her a poem the morning after it was just the polite thing to do uh, if, and even if you were going to just hit it and quit it and I was just, I was like, huh, Kat and Leo, what do you think about this practice of guys, like, sending a poem to the girl they had sex with last night? <laughs> like, do you think this is a good idea? Do you think this is a bad idea? Does, should this continue well, to happen today? You know, there was probably a lot of poems that were just, like, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> And then they, they, they like snigger, and then the girl shows her friends. Like, look at this fucking shitty poem. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I think you. It would be all right if you like read it to her or mm-hmm. like said it to her yourself, not just send it randomly to her in her stupid shoe locker or whatever. Cat, have you ever uh, had a guy like sing a song for you or write a or read a poem to you as like part of trying not. to get you? Oh, okay. That's but I write poems, and I have oh. given pe- like people that I care about poems before. Not after I fucked them, though. That's, <laughs> that's not my style. Yeah, it's usually before, right? <laughs> no, no, it's usually like like long after we've been oh, dating okay. for a while. I'm like, here's this poem I fucking wrote for you, you dumbass. Uh, Read I, it if you want. I wrote a song once for a girl when I was in college, and we were not dating yet. It was, so it was like to try to end up dating her which it did not work out immediately and it but it did eventually work uh, oh. a couple years later so i highly oh, but recommend then, but it but then can you really can you really say it was the poem if it was years later come I on think now, it was pro- i think it's partially the poem it, it's a stretch become i think it helps <laughs> So anyway, meanwhile, uh, Suo, the master, calls Chihaya and takes her up on her request for a practice game. Um, and apparently he only practices for like two months of the year as the just the two months leading up to the master's match because he's lazy. But he's really well liked by his old Karata club, which Sudo is actually a part of as well. I think it's the Karata club at Tokyo University, which is probably a pretty good one. Um and Taichi, he's keeping up the whole guise that he's Chihaya's boyfriend, which he lied to um, Suo about. So he goes along with her. Um, and there's like a quick bit about how the Masters match is only going to be streamed online on like Nico Nico video this year instead of aired on television, which Suo was kind of upset about. And like that's what he's like thinking about when he goes into his match with Chihaya. Uh, And it's a pretty big match for her because it's a chance to actually go up against the best of the best, which everybody would want to do who is in her position. Um, But she finds that Suo plays a really nasty kind of karata where he just puts a ton of pressure on you because he's so fast uh, at getting like one and two syllable cards. Uh, And then with that pressure, he also just baits you into making mistakes, like faulting on cards. Like he'll swing at cards that like aren't even... Even when it's a dead card, it just bait you into hitting cards that like have the same first syllable as the one that was spoken. Um, and so, yeah, he's pretty nasty, and he easily baits Chihaya into faulting a whole bunch, and she loses by 14 cards. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, <laughs> but he's like really amused by her. He's He says basically that, huh, you have a boyfriend, you have lots of friends, uh, and yet you still want to be queen, huh? And then at the very end of the episode, he says, you can't. And so I think, in my opinion, what Suet was focusing on here is just the whole, all the distractions Chihaya has. Like her, her team, her friends, the boyfriend that she thinks she, he, she has, he thinks she has. And so when he looks at a queen like Shinobu, she's like completely isolated. 
herself from most people. And it's the same with Suo. Even though he comes and hangs out with his Karata club sometimes, he's basically isolated himself from all of them. And I think he feels that if Chihaya isn't the same way, then there's no way she could be good enough to compete for the title of queen. Which... I don't know. He could be right about. I mean, we'll probably have to see. I mean, I hope that he gets proven wrong, uh, if not by Chihaya, then by somebody else. But yeah, it was pretty interesting. Whew. Oh, <laughs> love a good, love a good episode of Chihaya for you. Oh, it's so do, good. do you? I do. Do you become all right? <laughs> all right, let's move on. Uh, so what do we got? Keep your hands off, uh, Azukokin. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Episode three, let's accomplish something. <laughs> um, we finally get confirmation that they are calling their little studio slash club Azokin. So mm-hmm. that was a question I had earlier on. I didn't. Nobody was really too sure, but that's what we assumed. Uh, yeah. And then just immediately, I just can't get past Sayaka's teeth. It. <laughs> They're like a train wreck. You can't look away. <laughs> like I am so disturbed. But when they're on screen, that's all I see. There's some American she, cartoons where they have teeth like that. I'm trying to think is like Powerpuff Girls. They have like those like weird teeth. Like there's a bunch of American cartoons cartoons that have that style. Powerpuff Girls do not have that weird teeth. Ah, isn't it? I'll, I'll figure it out. There's something that has teeth like that. But yes, um, but fortunately the show needs her because she's the only person who can keep the other two on track. Yeah, but dumb <laughs> train wrecks. Yeah, tracks. Okay, so like- <laughs> I will say, like, this episode really showed me, holy shit, without Sayaka, these two would be just, like, spinning in fucking circles on the ground, smushing (laughs) dirt into their faces or something. Oh, yeah, it wouldn't happen without her. Yeah, I Uh, I feel like this is the type of show that, like, the producers at an anime studio and the artists at an anime studio could both watch and laugh at and love from both of their perspectives. Because they're getting all of it. You know the producers are like, yeah, that's right. These (laughs) fucking feet. Like, without us, they'd be nothing. They can't function without us. And they're, like, snickering in the background. It's true, though. The artists are kind of looking to the side, whistling, like, oh, what are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, yeah. I got Um, so irritated irritated with these two in this episode because they do that one of their stupid adventure things yeah and they're not getting done what they're supposed to be fucking doing or they're like idealistically i want to do it this way (laughs) and she's like literally you can't literally (laughs) i'm just telling you the truth of the thing and they're like no but i want to defy reality and it's like oh Oh, so, I felt for her so bad. <laughs> Sayaka, I was like, oh, poor yeah. Sayaka. She seems to be pretty popular. Sayaka is trying to tell the other two about all the expenses they have to to get for the studio to get off the ground and get going and all this stuff. But then like, they both immediately get distracted by like a butterfly. It's just like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> They're like little children. <laughs> also, there's that, there's that fall video that Midori uh, did on accident where she fell from the balcony. I, apparently they got 30,000 yen from it, which was $267.71 by today's mm-hmm. conversion rate. Uh, but they've already spent all of it on repairs for their little studio. They just got like some change left or something like that. Okay. So Midori volunteers to start working on the holes outside the building. And Sayaka goes back in to help uh, Subame outside. Midori is pretending she is in space and painting a spaceship. Yeah. For, yeah. for no fucking reason. She's yeah. just like, you know, this this needs me pretending like a five year old that I'm in a spaceship. And she's supposed to be like drilling on or screwing on like sheets oh. on the hole. So she's not even doing what she originally was supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. Like, this is why I get frustrated. She's like, oh, I know I'm supposed to be doing X, but instead I'm gonna do everything but. Yep. Like Yeah, oh. so why did I put Midori at Sayaka? Uh, so Sayaka oh. catches uh, Midori with a bucket on her head, and she's like spray painting like rabbits on the side of the studio. She's like, <laughs> "Fucking stop that shit and go get." They'll fix the holes on the roof, and like, I don't know how they didn't fall through the roof. Yeah, honestly, because later uh, Sayaka literally runs through the wall. So I'm like, this place should be coming down around them. Uh, yeah, I know. This place must be so fragile. Like, they yeah. could flick the wall and it would just come down. <laughs> yeah. Also, you're not running through a steel rusted wall without 
getting some fucked up cuts. I don't Anyways, know if it was steel. It sounded like it seemed like aluminum. St- I don't it's know. It's like an, it's still gonna fuck you up. It's still gonna be rough. But hey, Sayaka's yeah, got like steel teeth. You know, she yeah, she, she, she runs just busted through with the teeth. <laughs> So maybe she's a part beaver. Maybe she should be in Seiton Academy. Uh, <laughs> Midori and Tsubame get on the roof and pretend they are like astronauts fixing a hole in a spaceship. In their fantasy, they get bombarded by debris. And it turns out it actually started hailing in real life. Mm-hmm. And like, it's funny because Sayaka's inside. She knows it's hailing and she's just like, fuck this too. <laughs> <Leave them. laughs> Basically. Yeah. yeah, but they want to get off the roof, but the ladder's been locked knocked over and Subami's like I really have to be really really bad so they have to call for Sayaka who plays along with their fantasy of being like astronauts she eventually has to burst through a wall to get outside I don't know why she couldn't use the door it was door. blocked by like that big desk that she was building inside there I think she blocked her exit basically and so she had to just run through the fucking wall why the fuck did she build a desk in front of a door cause she's stupid too <laughs> That's my uh, opinion, anyway. <laughs> uh, but she managed to get outside, but the other two like ended up sliding down a water pipe, and all Sayaka's efforts were just like pointless. Yeah. And then, like out of nowhere, the club advisor briefly stops by to give them a flyer for a meeting where clubs can like request their budgets and like become official clubs and all that stuff like that. Uh, they also have to like announce a project they are working on and impress the council to basically get approved. So they go to Midori's place to check out uh, a bunch of ideas from like for their project uh and she has like a couple like uh sketchbooks full of like backgrounds and stuff um but on their way the train is like full of ads featuring subame and like she gets recognized by two people and it's just really funny how she switches from like dorky geek girl to like model mode yeah just instantly and like even sayak is like a little impressed by it she's like what the fuck <laughs> i was also kind of like thrown off because like, one of the girls who comes up to her uh is wearing a slipknot hat and i was like wow i did not expect to see a slipknot hat in an anime anytime soon but that's cool <laughs> holy shit was it yeah it was like s-l-p-k-n-t so it was i don't know it wasn't all spelled out but it was definitely looked like the slipknot logo too. that's yeah wow that's oh yeah that is really random that you point that out <laughs> holy super shit. random they end up going through some of the sketches to pick a scene, and when they finally find one they like, Midori introduces like a tank to be part of it, and it's got like interesting quirks. Quirks. And Subami's like, you know what? I think I can animate it, but I've never done special effects like explosion and smoke. But I'll, I'll give it a try first and see if I can get those to work. And she also talks about how like, animators will actually like swing a real swor- uh, sword mm-hmm. while they're animating. Was it? Was it a sword? sword. sword. It's a sword. <laughs> I don't know why I said it's a sword. <laughs> Just so they like get the movements down, right? And I just thought that was really interesting. I'm like, that makes sense, like a hundred percent. And they're even talking about like the creases and like the clothes they're wearing when they make that move. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome and perfect, actually. <laughs> well, but you think that they would just get like a swordsman in mm-hmm. to do it? Well, like, instead video. of doing it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also thought like, I mean, they could watch a movie or a YouTube video. I mean, they're just making that movement. So you're going to see the same creases, but it's probably a little bit different when you do it yourself. Yeah. You feel the you weight may, of it. You're, yeah. you're going to feel the weight of it. You're going to notice, like, I think they mentioned like the position of your hips, which maybe you wouldn't have noticed that much before just by watching. Mm-hmm. So there, there's an advantage to that. And also, it's then, expensive to get a swordsman in to actually show you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they finish out the episode with us watching the animation they created where a schoolgirl with a sword with a machete fights a tank and a little bit about some shortcuts they use because of their like limited time and like budgets like the same explosion, but they just showed it on like repeat as like multiple shots being fired or something like that, which is really cool. So that's that's neat stuff. Yeah, so I was I was a little bored with the first part of the episode, like you said, because it was just like the two you know creative girls fucking around. But um, the second yeah, half, when she st- when Sayaka <laughs> yeah. started to spiel, Subame is at a fan with a leak, and she's like pushing <laughs> it into the fan, and like I don't remember what Midori was, but it was just something just stupid. And there's like oh a fucking butterfly, and then later on there's like a raccoon looking inside, and they're like oh my god, it's a tanuki. <laughs> so, what do you I'm just like, why is there a fucking raccoon? It was just Stop so it. random. Yeah, it was weird. And then, and then, like later on, they're like, "We, we have." Oh wait, that's next episode. I'll tell. But it, it, right later, the raccoon comes back, and I'm like, yeah, "This is stupid." Yeah. yeah. 
But okay, I like the I really liked the just conversation between Sayaka and Subame in the second half of the episode because Subame is basically really adamant about no, if we're gonna animate things, I want them to be animated. I want them to move. And Sayaka's like, no, we should do the least amount of work possible. It could be still frames for all I care, as long as it looks cool. And Subame just refuses. She's like, No, we need to like have actual motion. And this is like what I honestly always look for in animation is things actually moving uh, which there's a lot of in this show especially like the second half of this episode when she's like say Subama is demonstrating how she falls down a bank and how like that's all animated and like while it's I, I like Sayaka has a really good argument though in saying that you falling down doesn't look cool so it's not going to get us any money and but she's like but it it looks natural it looks how a human would move um, but then all the stuff with the swordsman was just gorgeously animated like the, especially that sketch drawn section of like the swordsman just unsheathing the sword and like you know having like a downward like slice and everything um and then as she imagines the character like on the background like they use like a sunny window as a light box and then they like j- have her jump into the world and they show her like battling with the tank all of that shit was animated fucking beautifully even if, even though it just looks like storyboards because that's what they're going yeah. for uh, but there's so much motion and so much cool motion going on there um and so yeah but it is that it, it reminded me also when midori is like oh well we can cut some corners we can make one explosion and then we can show a whole line of explosions that are exactly the same and i'm like oh my god that's just studio trigger that's <laughs> literally what studio trigger does all the time um uh, not that they don't animate the shit out of things but they do stuff like that where they copy something over for effects or have like a whole army of like the same person talking to you for effect and it's just a copied animation but it looks really cool um and so yeah it's all it's always that battle between the animators who want to animate something they want to take their time and painstakingly make it perfect and the producers who are like you have 10 minutes (laughs) to do this so yeah it's the unending battle inside the anime industry (laughs) i love it yeah it's interesting. Like, I, I get really irritated sometimes with how um, in-depth some of the imaginative sequences go. Because mm-hmm. I'll just be like, come on, we've been in this sequence for like seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, th- none of this matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fair. It's like not necessarily pushing the story forward. Um, the the plot. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. not, yeah. But, but I mean, I like this, the story overall. It's just those particular moments I get kind of frustrated with, I would say. I think the music really helps. I really just like that guitar music that plays behind everything. Um, I agree. Gets me in the mood. Yep, yep. All right. Moving on. Next show. Holy shit. Can she Let's get the title deep. right? Can she get it right? <laughs> ID invaded <laughs> invaded get it no, they're talking about no, the fucking subconscious fuck the subconscious is one. the id I for fuck's sake to say it's ID invaded <laughs> well you're wrong you know what it could be their ID being invaded when he goes into that thing isn't he a different person he's the detective no he's That's invading his identity. somebody's his identity id was he's invading somebody's id his identity id. was it's invaded like, no it could be either one no, it it's could not. Because <laughs> they specifically <laughs> talk about them going into the subconscious. <laughs> this is what you get when your title screen for your show has all capital letters so nobody knows what's... <laughs> like, if the ID wasn't all caps, if it was I lowercase d, then Cat would probably call it id invaded, but... <laughs> I don't care. I want it to be ID invaded. It's going to be because I say so. Uh-huh. Uh. <laughs> anyway so <laughs> this episode um, they go against this serial killer called pyrotechnician mm-hmm. there's a lot of flashbacks at the be- very beginning of this episode with um, with the main guy and I, I like butcher his name Sakaido I'm, I'm not gonna say his last name because like well so it's, it's not I don't think it's his last name so Sakaido is the name he has when he's the detective inside the idwell and then i guess his okay. real name is this with the nari hisago no yeah. no yeah nari hisago or whatever yeah. 
um, I don't know. I'm going to call him Sakaido. Yeah. There's a lot of flashbacks with him talking about, I guess he used to be a cop, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Detective. Homicide detective. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess makes sense why he's so good at what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, I don't know. He has like a sequence where it's almost like his dream, like what he would want to have been what what happened. And his daughter, he guess he used to have a wife and a daughter. And his daughter is like saying how he he does so well at work and he gets all these like glowing reviews and like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I was also a detective? Do you think I have what it takes? And he's just like, this never happened because I was never home with the children. And like, oh, life was grim. And like, I didn't do that well at work, actually. My, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, well, geez, yeah. like, okay. Um, and then I guess his family got killed, but they like, don't really tell you a lot about what happened, which is interesting. They just tell you, like, you all of the injuries his daughter you had. You know how, exactly yeah. how his daughter died. Yeah. She's yeah. fucking, all her bones are broken. She's got, like, her spleen, her appendix, her fucking kidneys are all, like, exploded even, like, her heart. And she's, like, forced to, like, fight in, like, this, like, fucked up condition. So she dies, like, fucking horribly, just, like, so awful. And I was like... Jesus Christ, you're like way overselling his his daughter's death. What the fuck? Yeah, it's very brutal. I think it's just supposed to be like his trauma, which makes sense because every Okay, so every time he goes into one of those um like Ids. id things. Oh, fuck you, Leo. <laughs> fuck you. Uh, every time he goes into one of them, <laughs> like doesn't the per like the person is supposed to be his daughter? Well, right? he he vi- visualizes this girl Kairu, whatever whatever as yeah. his daughter. But it's not actually his it's daughter. It's not actually her, but that's how he thinks of her. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, he's a, he knows kind of, this, too. But okay. he just, like, goes with it, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, yeah, it's his, it's a visualization of his daughter. I'm imagining it's all kind of connected. Yeah. And then does anyone else feel like the um, Hondo Machi looks so much like his fucking daughter? Yes. Like, so much. Also, her eyes look a lot like Kairu's eyes in the void. Yes. And like, yeah, they all look very similar to me for sure. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it might just be that the animation is similar or it could yeah. be like, da-da, like secretly, but I don't know. I was thinking um, the same thing. I was like, I don't know if this is character design or if they're trying to tell me they're, these are yeah, just it could related. Be bad character yeah. design. It could just be that like, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's not, it wasn't intentional, but we're seeing it that way. Or it could be actually something's going on i did think it was interesting when like there was a scene between home machi and matsuoka <laughs> that was weirdly parallel to the scene that sakaido had with his daughter in that dream oh and yeah so that was interesting i was like is this supposed to be a cue like is this supposed to be kind of like a clue or something i wasn't sure there was also that interesting thing matsuoka said that basically if even if your body dies outside of the idwell if if you're like I guess soul is inside the idwell at the time. You could oh, live yeah. on. You could basically. I and I could. I would say like you could basically be immortal in that sense. Like I don't know. It's weird. Is this when Matsuoko goes on his like little spiel? Yeah, exactly. Because he started this and my brain just shut down. I'm like, I'm <laughs> hey, that's not, understandable. Because I'm it was, not going to follow really along like with that. this. It was interesting no, I though. The but, idea yeah. of that like you're just eternal. Then like if you. If you go into your own subconscious, you're eternal. Like you create an eternal, like existence for yourself within your own universe. Yeah, I wonder if that or it explains... doesn't matter if your body dies. Yeah, I wonder if that explains a bit about like some of the people that they do see inside the Idwells, like that bad guy in oh, episode one, and and maybe even yeah. Kairu. Uh, yeah, like maybe they're all trapped. Yeah, and, and eternally. Ooh, that's interesting. That's an interesting idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I like I like all of this. Leah's like, fuck that part. It was like a I'm little like, bit boring no. the way they presented that part, but yeah. I, I, Are yeah. you kidding? I was really interested in it, but <laughs> um, so yeah. Anyway, this this uh, serial killer that they do this episode, he uses fireworks to like scare people, and they're running around, and then he snipes them. Um, and you and you kind of find out like he was a war vet. Like he used to see this sort of stuff all the time. And then eventually he got to be like weirdly obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and just started to sort of create that same scenario that he was used to seeing and kind of observing it and getting something out of it. Um, the scene in the id where he's like, Pretending to be one of the bystanders, and he's like, "Oh no, be careful! Yeah. Everybody, Everybody, keep running!" 
and I'm just like, Whoa. just keep running for my amusement. You're doing great. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty unsettling. Oh, yeah, that's pretty weird. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, by the way, like in that scene where where they figure out that he's a war veteran and then there's it flashing in like the command center is political alert, political alert. <laughs> I was laughing so hard at that because basically, yeah, they, they get a message that's like, oh, this is politically relevant. And then they're like, oh, we could can we could get this information. And then the main guy there is like, no, let's not because that might get us like censured politically. So it's interesting. Oh. They have to like stay away from certain things so as to like not get called out. That's interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. I didn't notice that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. And then I guess this dude, when they catch him, ends up in a cell across from um, uh, Sakaido, and like he dr- he drives him to commit suicide. And I'm just like, yeah. the fuck. That was weird. In this like really low voice, monotone voice, like <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. yeah. He's just like, do it. Um I just think it's so sad. I want to know what the fuck he did to to end up there. Like, cause we know that he used to be a detective. We know his family died. Yeah. But we don't know what he fucking did. Yet. I would assume of- he sought revenge on the murderer of his family. Yeah, but then I. Well, but, yeah. but you have to be a serial killer, right? No, to, to be able to go. You just have to. Or just kill. a killer. Yeah, yeah you, you just, just have to okay. kill. Yeah, the person who killed I, I his thought, family was a serial killer, though, called okay, Challenger. I, I was or something. like, yeah. I was I was worried for a second, like maybe he became a serial killer, but okay, that makes. It hey, maybe better. I don't know. He's down there with all the other ones in those like glass yeah, rooms. Yeah, like wouldn't they just put him in like like a, a regular cell if he just killed one person? I don't know. Yeah. But he's a detective, so they can use him in this experimental government system they have. So <laughs> I guess. They had to pick somebody. He's a pretty good candidate, I'd say. I mean, yeah. I, I really fucking want to know, like, first off, what the fuck happened to his family? Second of all, like, who he killed. Like, I want to know the rest of the story. It's bugging me. I think we made a good choice so far with this show. It was... It was- Unfortunate that he talked the guy to his own suicide, but like I did like that he was just calling him out on his just bullshit worldview about yeah. like oh no nobody everybody's empty nobody cares about anyone else because they take pictures of you know buildings blowing up and Sakata's like no dude if you see a fucking explosion you take a picture and you, you show it to people because that's how you cope with shit like that and also it's just like a really crazy thing to see so of course people are going to do it it's like when you're driving on a highway and there's a fucking accident in the other side of the highway and every car slows down to see the accident <laughs> causing a traffic you mean jam. like a train yeah. wreck yeah like a train wreck exactly just like that <laughs> yeah i my the only other i have a, a it's just only a slight complaint but they just kind of sidelined hondo machi this episode a little bit, besides that one speech. Uh, yeah, just right there in the beginning, and then there's just no more mention of her, and like I think she's a really interesting character. And yeah. she has such an interest in this system and like how it works, and like she wants to go in like Saikaido does. But he, she keeps being told, you're like, you haven't killed anybody, you can't go in. That's not how it works. But she basically kind of found out this episode that she probably could go in in the future, because uh, she when she was being attacked and or actually not when not when, when she, she was, was tied to a table yeah. and a drill was going she formed through her head. And well like in the last episode and that means that apparently she has like the capability but it's, yeah. it depends how good she is whether she would ever be able to do what Sakaido does um but i i assume we're going to see her going inside end wells pretty soon yeah so. i mean when she leaned into that drill i was like all right you got my respect <laughs> you're <laughs> kind of nuts. a badass <laughs> She's like, I lost some of my front lobe. <laughs> You're a little weak girl, but the bravery yeah. you showed, I'm like, all right, you got my respects, girl. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah, she's like, it's fine. It's just the not the part that has pleasure in it, though. That's not it, it doesn't affect my anger and pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then like, like sexy wink, like, blah, not really, but I'm just like, what are you trying to say here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of losing your head, uh, Doro Hedero. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what a transition. Episode three, Night of the Dead. Duel in front of the main department store. Uh, so continuing on from the last episode, 
N has asked the sorcerers Shin and Noi to hunt down, you know, the main characters, Kaimon and Nikaido. Um, but first he asks Noi to heal Ebisu, who had gotten her face ripped off. <laughs> yeah, so real quick, like, yeah. the way this episode started, I was like, am I misreading how episode two ended i went back and, and I, watched and i was i like, went back yeah. and watched two you know yeah. it's it's like it's like those two are heading out to do it but then when episode three starts they're having dinner and i'm just like what what whoa huh yeah it doesn't like it doesn't perfectly like fit like two puzzle no. pieces come together like like the the whole plot with um n and the sending everybody after kaimon and nikado that works but the yeah what you're talking about was like a little awkward yeah um. So yeah, uh, Ebisu uh, apparently has like lizard power knowledge, so they want her to tell them about Kaimon, but she doesn't really get her memories back immediately. Um, oh no, she's super fucked up. She goes through all <laughs> kinds of traumatic shit. So like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hilarious. She, yeah. So um, apparently in whole the whole or whatever. There is a day of the living dead, basically, uh, <laughs> based on some old zombie movies and stuff where like the smoke, the sorcerer spread in the sky is at its strongest this time of year. And it causes people who were killed by sorcerers to literally rise from the dead as zombies. Um, so there's these. But m- they make sure to make a game about it. So yeah, when they bury game. them, they put these plates in their necks and they can collect these plates and they can get prizes when you get so many <laughs> tickets. Like an arcade. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Like <laughs> Realm Royale. <laughs> like, <laughs> so um, with the help of some monks who are like spraying purifying salt on the zombies, zombies as people kill them. Uh, zombies. Zombies. Uh, Kaimon and Nikaido are... Zombies just- and swords. Yeah, they're taking out as many as they can because uh, Nikaido sees that they can exchange plates for a meat grinder, which she could use at her gyoza shop to like better grind the meat for the gyoza. Um, but yeah, after collecting a few plates, killing a bunch of zombies, they're just taking a break for some cup ramen. Uh, and they're confronted by all four of these sorcerers, Shin, Noi, Fujita, and Ebisu. Uh, who quickly gets turned into a zombie. She just kinda, starts getting which nommed is, on. Like, funny, because <laughs> she acts like a zombie the rest of the time. And, like, it's <laughs> yeah. taking everything uh, Fujita has to like keep her from like trying to chomp on people. <laughs> which is just kind of hilarious the whole time that that's going on. <laughs> um, but I, that evens the battle out a little bit. So then you can match up Shin uh, with uh, Kaimon and Noi with Nikaido, which is pretty epic matchup, I would say. Um, Noi is like pretty excited by how strong Nikaido is, uh, but once she gets serious, she basically just handles her like nothing. She throws a haymaker into her stomach and just sends her flying across the fucking street. Um, I really like the music in this scene. It's like pretty heavy metal and fun. Like the song for some reason, I don't know why, but like my memory like remembers this one track from Con Air, the movie with Nicolas Cage. I swear oh, there's a guitar. God. There's a guitar part in that movie with the exact same like chord progression as the song that plays here. So I, I got to go find it at some point because I don't know what the hell the track is called. Nobody but. move or the bunny gets it. I <laughs> always remember that fucking line from Con Air. Hey, Cat, he's holding a stuffed bunny and he has like a gun to its head. And he's like, nobody move or the bunny gets it. And they're just, okay. everybody's like kind of just like stunned for a second. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Does, do they think we care? Yeah. Oh, God, I love that movie. It's so dumb. It is a pretty good movie. Oh, I love Very it. Very yeah. entertaining. Yeah. Uh, Kaiman also is pretty reckless when he fights Shin, and he also gets his ass handed to him pretty easily. Um, Shin breaks Kaiman's b- blade with the claw end of his hammer, um, and then Kaiman gets hit in the head with the hammer and falls to the ground, and Shin only mistake he makes is thinking that Kaiman's done because he doesn't pay attention for the second or a second and then instantly Kaiman like friggin stabs him in the heart with his broken knife um, then he swallows Shin's head and you know they have the typical meeting where <laughs> the guy inside Kaiman's mouth talks to Shin and is like you're not the dude and then you know they get out of there and Shin is like what the fuck and he rips Kaiman's entire head off 
Yep. Um, but somehow he's still not dead. Uh, whatever magic the sorcerer who made Kaimon's head put on him is real strong. Um, Nikaido also, at this point, gets up. And we find out that she is a sorcerer because she gets that was on, an yeah. awesome reveal. It was pretty cool. It's, it makes her a lot more interesting. Um, and yeah. she's a sorcerer who had promised herself that she would never use her powers again. Because uh, she says that basically when she's opening a gateway to escape with Kaimon. Um, and so, yeah, they when they reemerge, that doctor guy is like on the street. Uh, and he had been cornered by a zombie earlier in the show, but he like used some poison ball to kill it, so he's fine. Um, but yeah, Kaiman's head just grows back, which is not a thing that lizard heads do. Um, it took him like two days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so the doc tells him, hey, by the way, uh, Nikaido is a sorcerer, and you hate sorcerers. Uh, but he basically doesn't really want to believe it at first. He just like laughs it off. Uh, and he goes back to the gyoza shop and gives Nikaido the meat grinder. Uh, but he's definitely thinking about it. He, but he just doesn't know what to say about it yet. Um, and yeah. the doc also gives him his old head in a jar as a present. And I was like, that's very Futurama. Uh, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> um, so then there's this like, weird scene where it's unclear if Kaimon is dreaming. He walks past the alley where he kind of remembers dying. Uh, no, that's one of his dreams. Because he keeps having yeah. those weird dreams with the alleys, and then he wakes up in bed with his pillow stuck to the back of his head. Yeah, and he <laughs> sees that guy at the other end of the alley who has his uh, head in a jar just like him. And I'm thinking that's what his face used to look like before he got turned into a lizard. Like a, a guy with like blonde hair. I'm assuming that's who that guy is. Um, and Nikaido explains that bef- like before she met Kaimon... She was working as a cleaner, taking care of like corpses that, uh, like magic victims, like who were or like that sorcerers would kill and leave in the hole. So she would like take those and clean them up. Right, and that was her job, and she hated it. Um, and in the alley from Kaimon's dream, she found this headless body, which was him, obviously. And she she put it in a body bag, and then like went to tell her friends about it. And then when she got back, the body bag had gotten up and walked away, and then come back came back. Um, and so that's how she found him, basically. And so Kaimon's like, "All right, that's fucked up. Let's dissect my old head and find out more about this." <laughs> and so yeah, this gets really interesting here. Yeah, they find out instead of a reptile brain or anything like that, he has a perfectly normal, like functional human brain in his head or his old head. But then when they try to check down his throat to see what's going on there, like the whole all the power in the hospital goes out, and they go to check the breaker. And Nikaido has, or sorry, uh, Kaimon has this vision in the alleyway where he sees that like same shadowy figure he saw in his dream. And when the lights come back on, the doc yells like, hey, somebody took the head and it's gone. And so they had been shooting the whole operation on a camcorder, like for, you know, to look at it later. And so they see even in the camcorder footage when they slow it down, like there's like a shadowy guy there. Uh, and who clearly took the head away. So it's real weird. It's very spooky. Um, and then, yeah, just at the end of the episode, there's a quick scene where the sorcerer dude, N, is checking out his new, like, powered hover broom thing. Uh, it's like a fucking motorcycle hover bike and also a broom, which is yep. pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, when Shin comes yelling to tell him about Kaimon and... Ends basically like, don't worry, we've got we've got it covered or something. And that's where the episode ends. But yeah, yeah, you were saying, yeah, you were saying earlier that like you're loving the animation and like the background art in this show, especially the background art. It's just like so dripping with like the the whole place feels dirty and gritty and lived in. Um, it's so like intricately drawn, and yeah, I really love the character designs, like. Especially Noi, like when she pulls off her stupid mask and you see that she's just like, it's huge, like brawny woman. Like, it's so cool. And yeah, uh, she's such a cool character. <laughs> the way you said that, brawny, brawny woman. woman. I, know what, I know what kind of porn because <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I gotta look for some uh, Doro hetero dojins. Let's see what's oh out there. I also really, this is my favorite OP of the season so far. Oh, it's really I, good. I... <laughs> think it's fucking great 
it may Love be it. hard to top for like this entire year honestly it's it's gonna be one of the best ops of the year for sure like as she just like gets more and more and more excited about fucking cooking her goddamn gyoza and just like the knives going everywhere she chops it up like oh it's so good it when like the cockroach monster pops up on the screen and starts like running around it's so <laughs> it's fuck it it's so awesome to watch it's so awesome to listen to it just i love it Oh, and they've been it. doing a new ED like every episode. There was another new I one this episode. I noticed that. Yeah. What? That's for. Has it been every episode so far? I think so because there was a different one in episode two. I don't really remember episode one, but I assume it was different then as well. And I think they're all by No Name, who I remember for doing really good EDs on Soccer Quest as well. But they sound completely different here. Like it's wow, like that's a totally two different completely style. different anime if I ever <laughs> yeah. <just> heard of. <laughs> I, so it tells me that they have a lot of range because yeah, they they definitely sound completely different playing here. So huh. yeah, it's really cool. But yeah, the, the ED was know. like not animated the best, but it was just like the characters like running around and like there's one cut where like a bunch of zombies are following them and stuff around town. It, it looks fine. The song is really good though. So yeah, all right. It's pretty cool. Let's uh, take a break. All right. Be right back. Yeah, we'll see you in a minute. Hey. Hey. Do you like wrestling? Whether it be in a bar, an arena, some weird place in Asia, or in a stadium. Or the occasional penis plex. Well, if any of these things might tickle your fancy, anywhere in between from penises to wrestling, you can come and check out our podcast. Our podcast name is Smack It Down. We talk all things WWE, New Japan, anything else in between. I'm Jay Silver. I'm Corey Gold. And we look forward to you joining us. Happy Rusev Day. Happy Rusev Day, indeed. The Trash Pandas bring you this nugget from another trash can. What happens when Brains and Bullets discuss episode two of One Punch Man? Pretty much gene splicing heads. They will oh, sp- yep, 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 yep. They will splice genes. They have a, a cyborg gorilla. They have a frog that walks on two legs and communicates at long range. Like, they got... You think it, they splice... The Lion King? Yeah, they, they have the lion... They have a f***ing lion. Beast King. And... Simba. Yeah, he's f***ing Simba. I don't mean he's f***ing Simba. I mean he's f***ing Simba. We at Trash Pandas Watch Anime dig through the trash so you don't have to. You can find the Trash Pandas Watch Anime podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we'll get live updates from what we do. All right, and now we are back, guys. Yeah. <laughs> with Satan Academy, join the pack, episode three. Those who strip with the ones they love. Uh, I don't know if I'm reading into this, but if you look at Hitomi's character on here, if you look at her hairpin, it yeah. looks a lot like the female gender sim- symbol, just slightly altered. It does slightly look a like that. Bit. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I just don't know if that means something or it just happenstance seems to be close. But like when I first saw that, I was like. Oh, I can't remember which symbol meant which. Which is she going to turn out to be a guy in the end? Just like I don't know. <laughs> that was like, but that's the female symbol. But I just like the ultimate, just like stake to the heart for Jin. She's just like I mean, I Jin does win. seem to think she's perfect. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, so the student council president is announcing this year's motto, and that is: if you witness an unnatural interspecies relations, eradicate them. <laughs> and obviously, this is a big problem for our merry little group. Uh, so the president's name is Miki, and she is a naked mole rat. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, to them, wearing clothes is embarrassing for her. And as soon as she gets back to like the student council room, she immediately rips her clothes off, and like the naked mole rats follow a hierarchy similar to like bees and ants. So there's a queen. Uh, she appears to be a queen. Basically, she just has a bunch of small minion mole rats of her own. Now, Kat, would you did you do you see yourself like in this role? Like, you just come home from work, you strip off all your clothes, and then there's like a bunch of tiny naked little men who just do whatever you want them to do. <laughs> I mean, you're acting like that's not already my experience. Uh, no, I mean. That's just weird. They're so tiny. Like, what would she do with them? I don't know. They would all crawl on her back and give her a massage she at the same time. Well, uses no, them as like, a film crew. To be her, they're supposed to be her partners, right? They're supposed to like, get her pregnant eventually. <laughs> it's like, what, do they, what does she do? 
they they get fired out of a cannon into the you know where <laughs> into her vagina. I, I feel like it would take like three or four of them. Like they all just have to gang in there or something. <laughs> I don't know. Do they all just like huddle in there? They're like, all right, guys, like we got to try and figure out why you both really had to think about this. At home. And then one of them's we got that stupid video camera that they have throughout the episode. It's like filming the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like this is what it looks like inside her. Oh, man. That, that it's turned into an interspecies reviewers episode. It's the magic school bus. <laughs> so Miki had her minions scout out the members of the cooking club. And it's kind of funny because, uh, Hitomi ends up running from them because they're like camera angles basically up skirt and she's like no stop ah. <laughs> uh, they find Miyubi who dies <laughs> as usual and they're, they're like that seems to happen a lot too uh, and finally they jo- join uh, Yukari on her quest for delicious food they end up getting to the point where they ask her what's the best thing she has tried and only get and she only gets out my mom's put and then, like, the credits <laughs> roll. <laughs> oh, God. And it's funny because, like, her eyes glaze over when she says it, too. So it's just like, <laughs> wow. Even she's like, knows it's fucked up. She really loves it. But really, Miki wants to know about Jen and Ranka, since they seem to be the heart of this club. Uh, the minions are like, I don't want to show you this because it might be a little too imperfect for you. But she's like, I demand you show me anyways. I am the queen, blah, blah, blah. And it's just footage of Ronka licking Jin's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you're right. It was too much. Yeah, she she's like crumples to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her, she, her conclusion is that Jin is trying to make an interspecies harm and commands her minions to collect evidence of his evil doings. She couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And then during a little cooking club, a pride of gal lion girls. And it's at times like this where I read these lines and I have to get up and just kind of go gaze out a window and take a few deep breaths before we come back and move on. Because the line, a pride of gal lion girls is just, that is out there. What the (laughs) fuck? What the fuck am I doing with my life? (laughs) Basically. (laughs) So... Yeah. So, anyways, a pride of gal, gal lion girls shows up and abduct Jen and Rinka and take them to their male leader, King. Uh, the King just wants dating advice since he fell in love with a, like an Impala girl, and these two are the only like interspecies couple in the school, so he thinks he will have advice for him. And but like when he fell in love with her, he was like waiting on his food from his pride of lion girls, and Jen's like, "Man, I think you were just hungry." <laughs> <laughs> But it eventually boils, boils down to, like, he's like, just fucking tell her her feelings, man. And, like, it turns out his harm only stays with him because they like his strength. But it's mainly because of his big, black, gorgeous mane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not not his, his big, black something else. No. His bl- <laughs> big, mane. black, yeah. gorgeous yeah. mane. And it turns yeah. out to be just a bunch of scenes of him, like, trying to talk to the Impala girl. And she's, like, running away every time. Uh, I will say to the lion's credit. I mean, the king's credit. When a rival shows up with the Impala as a hostage and demands to give him the lion's harem, he boldly states that women aren't objects to be given away. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, at least he expects his harm. That's cool. <laughs> it's yeah. different. Yeah. They're like, they see me as an object, but I don't see <laughs> yeah, them. They yeah, they all look true. at him as objects. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're just like, we're just here for the main. We just love the main. That's it. Uh, I, I, just, I don't get that. I'm like, it's just hair. Like, you can't do shit with it. Oh, they definitely stroke it and cuddle up against it for sure that's a whole scene i mean they Cat, groom it a lot it's l'oreal he's worth it <laughs> okay I, I i do get the the appeal of a guy with hair down his butt i've i've d- seen it before it's pretty but like come on <laughs> so uh the king eventually powers up almost straight up like a super saiyan the hair and everything and like beats the other guy's gang and eventually he chops off his own mane so that his harm would leave him and tells the other lion to leave them Paul out of this. And then they leave him, leave him and it's fine. Like, cause one of them on the way, I was like, call us when you grow your mane back out. <laughs> it's just like, wow. Uh, he does finally confess to them, Paula, but gets turned down because she currently isn't in heat. So I'm not in heat, senpai. But she's like, we can <laughs> oh be God. friends till then. Like he says he wants to be her partner. It's just like, Wow. <laughs> so would, would she have just banged him right then if she was in heat? Like, is that the implication there? Uh, that's like, my implication. I'm getting they're getting hot <laughs> and heavy here in high school. It's interesting. Oh, so man. also, like, what's the? I mean, what's the difference? They're not gonna have a kid. Yeah, it's also weird because it's a fucking impala in a line. Like, nothing a can happen and a herbivore, there. Yeah, 
But they're also Isn't he like. Is he just going to eat her? Is it going to be like the praying mantis? Like he just rips her head off as he comes or something? And it's also weird because, like, in this show. You're like, I'm not going to address that. I'm just going to move I'm, on. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> 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 uh, it's also weird in the show because like the Impala gir- like the girls are half human but the, the men are not so he's full lion who would be ha- having sex with a human Impala girl so it's just like what <laughs> is this I don't know I don't know it's a weird convoluted nightmare born inside some poor otaku's soul <laughs> yeah that's really what it is. Oh, man. So Miki sends out a summon out to Jen, and he, like, refuses. So she has to put on clothes herself and seek him out, which we know she hates. Yeah. She unfortunately gets ambushed on the way by Kurumi and, like, basically gets toyed with, and it's pretty funny. Uh, mm-hmm. She f- eventually makes it to Jen, and when she enters the room, she immediately rips her clothes off and calls him a pervert and accuses him <laughs> of trying to create interspecies harm. And Jen's like, fuck no i do not want to interspecies harm and at that moment king immediately walks in he's like hey man let me give you some advice on managing harm for your help earlier <laughs> and i was just like that's hilarious <laughs> i liked how mickey was like i ordered you to throw out all of the non-human members of this club yeah, and yeah. Just, so and, yeah. Mik- mickey says the club will be disbanded and he told me please with her not to so she decides they can keep the club if they kick out all the non-human members and jen's yeah. like yes, yes yes please tell me more but then suddenly ronka <laughs> shows up with her minions and she saved them from kurumi and the minions were like so thankful they asked mickey not to disband the club and she eventually relents <laughs> and then and then there's just a slight little short at the end after the credits where the gal Lion Pride's like, oh, we miss our king. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he grows his mane back. <laughs> uh, can we talk about how, how you've listened to the ED, right? And it's just Ronka singing, but singing like purposely off key. <laughs> like, oh really i haven't really paid funnier. attention to it. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. If you haven't heard it, like listen to it next time because like she just... It's so bad, but in a very funny way. Uh, her stupid voice just singing the CD cracks one, one me up every time. One thing that always I find funny with her is like when she jumps on the lick on them, like her tail gets like all bushy tailed and it's like waving like madly. Yeah. Like that's, I, I don't know. I just like that one little thing. And I just think it's funny. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Yeah. Everything about Ronka is pretty hilarious and cute, honestly. So, yeah. Uh, Ooh, yeah. speaking of little and cute, <laughs> Boofery. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kat, you have this one. Yes. Okay, so I, I'm like, so the only, I really was just excited in this episode for the part where they eat the colorful shit at the end. Oh, I, I love that scene. I, I like wrote a whole thing about that scene. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I like how in the beginning of this episode, Maple's class got a nerf. And I just like, I know Cat wouldn't really guess if I know Become could, but could you imagine that you are the sole reason that you <laughs> force the developers to send out an emergency patch for a game because you found some like amazing exploit? <laughs> It'd be pretty cool, actually. And that would be like, that's like a badge you would wear. You're just like, yeah, that was me for that game. <laughs> I broke this game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's right. Like, they had to. Yeah, no, that is pretty cool. That would be fun. But yeah, I don't know. While at a cafe, Maple and Sally hear about this next event that's going to happen from other players who tell them about this like quest in the forest. Mm-hmm. So, eh. Um, yeah, because they're like still on level one and they're like, is there anything we should go yeah, do? Yeah, they're like, we should yeah. do level two before the quest. And I was yeah. kind of like, all right, or before well, the next yeah, event. Yeah, but they also wanted to explore some of level one more before they moved on because they yeah. asked those yeah, guys because they advised. She advice. hadn't seen much, right? Like, she was like, I yeah. haven't seen anything. Yeah, we've so, just I mean, been in a cave sense. the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I would want to explore. I'd want to see it. Like, you never know what you find. Yeah. So. True. Um, but yeah, they find this like basement in an abandoned house where I'm like, why are you going in abandoned houses? That's weird, but (laughs) okay. Um, and there's a guy tied up in the chair (laughs) and they heal, they heal him and they earn this like super speed seal, which is nice, I guess. That guy was so weird. (laughs) I don't know. And the thing is, they never showed us what the ability was or how it did. I mean, if you go by the name, it's just super speed, but they didn't show it. And I thought that was, that was interesting. I assume Sally's going to use it at a key moment eventually. Yeah, Right. That's what I'm expecting probably in the next event, which like this whole chapter, I'm just like, I liked it, but I'm like, I want to see what the fucking next event is. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm excited because they're they've kind of hyped it up to the point now where it's either going to be really good or everyone's going to be like, "Well, that was dumb." So I don't know. Um, but yeah, then the next day, Mabel and Sally head to level two to face off against this weird, this deer boss thing, which you guys felt very strongly about. I thought it just looks so cool, like the way it, it formed cool. itself out of like the tree roots and vines. Like if I if I saw this in like say a Dark Souls game, I would be so hyped for this fight. Oh yeah, like, so, I would, so I'm fucking impressed. You're just like, what the fuck? You could totally imagine See, that version of this boss. And comparing like, it to yeah. Dark Souls is probably a perfect comparison because like this would be like a Dark Souls boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the crazy shit like that. I guess I don't know. Like for me, I guess maybe the fights and everything can fall a little flat because I don't play a ton of video games, mm-hmm. especially not first person ones. So I'm kind of like, yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah, I can I can see that. I I mean, I really did like the animation of just like Sally's movement during the fight, like the way she flips around. And there was one really good cut where she like uh, basically swings herself like vertically over like a branch to get more momentum to like kick down at the deer, and it just looked so good. Um, I just like all the effort they're putting in because I'm like I'm watching this and I'm thinking of like some of the fights in like recent episodes of Sword Art Online, I'm like, man, this show is trying so much harder than Sword Art Online is these <laughs> days. I um, mean, it deserves it more than Sword Art Online in some ways. <laughs> Maybe at this point. But like Sword, nice. Sword Art Online has this like huge fan base of people still. Like and and I wish they, well, they would died get a stuff. sad death like on a <laughs> chemo bed. They deserve shit. <laughs> Sword Art Online deserves shit. How many people are fucking watching it that aren't like weird, dedicated fans masturbating to the you know the girl characters in their basements? No oh one. God. Let's be real. You're Poor you're either fans. obsessed or you're not watching it anymore. It's dog shit. You know it. Even if you're I mean, watching it, you know it's dog Alice's shit. Alicization is pretty bad, but yeah, I don't know. That's why no one's covering it because it's dog shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just look at yourself in the reflection of your screen as you watch Alicization. <laughs> How do you feel about your life, Sword Art Online lovers? God, you're going to get some like hard angry. on Sword Art Online fans right now. Yeah, feel bad. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get some like angry <laughs> messages. I love it. Bring it on. Some, Tell me your some anger. Some dude with an Asana avatar is going to show up in the Discord like, I hate you. <laughs> Be like, yes, yes, give me your pain. Come on. Asana makes good sandwiches that taste good. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, so yeah, they, they killed like uh I guess Mabel gets knocked out by this deer boss. Sally manages to defeat it. Um but Mabel receives the Snow White shield she ordered. Yeah, that's cool. Um so that was cool. Uh and then they get the Starfield Mill, which is exciting. Yeah, okay, so earlier in the episode they went into that random log and like Sally shoots a fireball and they get transported to this area where it's just never ending sunset on a beach. And I'm like, that would be so sweet to experience in full dive VR, like you're actually there. You could just you could just always go to this place that has a perfect sunset. And then yeah, th- at this point in the episode, they go to eat at this basic restaurant that is under a huge starry night sky, and like their wine glasses are filled with the poured with the galaxies. Yeah, the galaxy pouring out of the universe, and like their food floats down from Sounds the like star. Their hair trip. and their eyes changing. Yeah, it's. It's oh, it's fucking trippy. awesome. Speaking of what oh, we were man. talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, um, no, it, it totally was. And then like the, the weird jelly thing. Mm-hmm. Um, wait, wasn't it like she said it tastes like three different fruits? Strawberries, apple, and something else. I can't remember. Like three fruits at the same time, which is like, oh, oh that sounds apple cool. Apple and peach, wasn't it? That might be right. Think, yeah. 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 And I was like, oh man, I want to taste that. Like. Imagine if you there was a f- real life fruit that tasted like a Starburst. Mmm, that sounds good. <laughs> it's like juicy and like chewy, but also so sweet. It's such a cool fucking idea. Like to a lot of like MMO just don't like talk about the cool shit like this. Like just the leisure areas, like how you can just go and experience like a weird new thing that you've never experienced in your life inside of an MMO. Like it's such a cool idea, and I like that they're just exploring those aspects as well as just cool boss fights and, and, you know, the normal stuff you would expect like leveling up. Like there's all these other cool things that you could do with this technology and it's cool to explore that. I feel like there would be whole games just with 
like just food based. Oh, if yeah. If this was a real thing. And people would just, it would be called like Glutton Punishment 2 or something. <laughs> and you would just go on and it would be a video game where you just eat yourself to death until you like burst open. And that's how you level up or something. And you just like, you get to taste everything. I was thinking about just how insanely indictive this would be if it existed in real life and how it would just single handedly ruin society. <laughs> like, I no mean, one nobody would, be able would to do eat anything. anymore. No, nobody would eat anymore because they just eat in the video game. Everyone, I mean, yeah. dieting would be over. Yeah, dieting would be over because you're like, oh, I feel like I'm satisfied. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You just have yeah, like an intravenous drip of like, you know, whatever fucking of, like, IV nutrients fluids. nutrients or whatever. Yeah. Or like you just eat, you get like these three bars a day and you just eat them. You're just like, whatever. <laughs> my real food gets in the game. That's oh what my I God. eat. Yeah. I'm excited for this future. <laughs> Bring it on. I want this future. Ready player one. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but yeah, let's, I, I like that the most, honestly. Uh, I, I actually was listening to a, like a review of a very fancy, um, like art film called, and then we danced, I think is what it's called hmm. or something. Okay. Um, and they were talking about how in the film they eat a lot and they, you know, and that how it like personalizes the characters and like shows you kind of their experience and all of this and how it's really important in these really more highbrow artsy films to do things like that because it makes it more down to earth and less like up in the clouds, you know? Interesting. And, and then when I was watching this, it made me think of that kind of, I was like, oh yeah, I could see that. Like, I could see why that happens. Like it worked that way for this. So, Yeah. This looks like it's a, I, a Georgian movie, like from the country yeah. Georgia. Yeah, like interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's very highbrow. It's like just coming out, I guess, in yeah. in theaters in the U.S. So like, I was listening to a review of it, and it seems interesting. Cool. We'll see. But yeah, um, and then the next episode should be this uh, this the second second event. events. They yeah. have to gather like silver things and get a gold thing if you get ten of them, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yep, yeah, and then they get new skills, which I assume... <laughs> Shiny new skills. They'll keep getting more overpowered, <laughs> and it'll be funny. Yes. All right, speaking of overpowered, high cue to the top. Um, hmm. Episode three is perspective. At the end of episode two, Hanada was talking about how he needed to change his perspective on things, so that's what this episode starts getting into. Um, he's starting off the episode just drying some of these washed jerseys of the you know, all prefecture practice team. But he's also taking the time to watch them closely. Um, and he notices that certain players are really receiving spikes very well. And he's looking at their form and trying to learn from it. Um, first, he looks at Ushijima, who's, you know, like the best of the best. And he notices that he's just really efficient with his movement. He doesn't waste any excess motion getting to where he needs to be. So I really liked how he was uh, explaining all this. Mm -hmm. It was really nice to have the commentary yeah it's like it's really interesting and it's clearly gonna like help him in the future and you can see how it's helping him and uh and it, it it he doesn't like go overly into it he doesn't drone on and get really boring about it it's just like kind of straight into the point and these are the things he's noticing and then when he's watching the other guy uh from behind who's taking uh spikes and he sees that like he does like a little jump step it reminds him when he used to play tennis with his friend Tama, which I don't know if this was in middle school or earlier in high school or what. I assume it was in middle school. Yeah, it looks uh, like like a middle school scene or something yeah. like that. And like even then, Hanata, who he freezes up sometimes when people go up for spikes, he doesn't know how to what to do or how to move. Uh, he does the same thing when he's playing tennis with his friend, where the ball's coming up at him and he's like, "Ah, what do I do?" And he tries to hit it, and you know he's not ready. And so his friend says, "Oh, if you feel like you don't know how to move your feet, then something I do sometimes is called a split step, where I take a little hop like at that time when like the opponent like hits the ball." And then I use that hop to propel myself into my next motion uh, and reset my whole entire form so I'm not stuck in the middle of a movement. Yeah, and that and, makes sense uh, to me. That's kind of cool. It's actually really cool. And, and so Hinata sees this guy on the volleyball court doing the same thing where when the guy's going up to hit the spike, he does the little split step and then propels himself in the direction that he needs to move. 
And so Hinata's like, oh, I got to try this. And he sort of gets it, like, the hang of it, like, the first time a little bit where, uh, like, a serve, like, ricochets off of the guy he's watching and then, like, just hits him right in the face. But he did get to the right position. Like, so, and the guys noticed that. They're like, oh, he was he was ready for that. That's kind of impressive. Um, and so he gets slowly better. Like, he's actually really bad at the timing at first. Um, a bunch of the guys stay after practice. One of them is named Goshiki uh, from Shiratorizawa. And it was really funny how Hinata like praised him. He's like, I love your street spikes. They're so cool. And Goshiki is like, I haven't felt like this for so long. Because <laughs> <laughs> all the guys on his team are like kind of monsters. They're all really good. And they're all, they don't praise him. They're just like, oh yeah, just do your job. And so he gets really excited and he stays afterwards and... Um, yeah, by like timing Goshiki's spikes, Hinata learns that like, oh no, I have to be earlier, I have to be quicker. And he also notices that he can tell based on the set, which I feel like is something he should have realized before this, before now, that like, oh yeah, where, <laughs> where the oh, ball like, is. Set. Are you just yeah. now getting it? Yeah, yeah like, it's almost like on, he dude. never thinks when he's playing. He was like, playing entirely on instinct before this point. Like, yeah. yeah. But I'm just like, Hinata, you have a thing between your <laughs> ears. It's called a brain. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. And so he's starting to finally use that brain now. Um, <laughs> use the squishy thing that jiggles <laughs> when you jump. Uh, Jesus. The, the Shiro Torizawa coach is still kind of being like, you know, a little bit of an enemy towards Hinata. He's not making things easy for him. He's he's not being mean or anything, but he's saying, you can't sleep here overnight. You didn't get invited to this training camp. And so he has to basically take a bus and then train and then bike ride home. A 30 minute bike ride home after all that. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's a long way home. There's a lot of dedication. But he also starts thinking about because he's really freaking hungry uh, because he's been helping practice all day. And then he's also been thinking a lot more, which is burning calories, too, and making him tired. So he calls his coach, Coach Ukai, and he's like, what should I eat? Uh, and the coach is basically like, all right, you need a sports drink that has amino acids in it uh, and probably a protein drink, too. And then carbs like either a banana or an orange juice. You can get this all at the convenience store on your way back. And then once you get home, eat a full meal, too, basically on top of that. And he's just like writing it all down. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. To me, I'm like, I'm like, this is kind of common sense shit, man. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, true. it's like eat a carb, eat a protein. Like. Hmm. It's the stuff that, you know, people who are serious about being athletes think about, but he hasn't been seriously thinking about anything. He's just been doing everything one step at a time. So, yeah, well, I bet this this is the type of show that's very interesting to people who have been like more professional league athletes or thought seriously about this kind of stuff because it's it's very familiar to them. So seeing someone go through it like, oh, step one, I have to eat this thing called protein. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of novel and cute, I bet. It is so. pretty cute. Yeah, it's like, oh, he's discovering yeah. that. How cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so like I was talking about earlier, he's back at practice the next day. Oh, actually, there's a short scene where Karasuno is practicing against a school called Tokonami, but there wasn't much to that scene. It was just like, oh, they're bad at serving and they're still bad. And they're doing diving drills in between, which is like impressing the other team with like their effort. But that really was all that scene was for. Um Back at the prefectural practice, Hinata is incorporating what he's learned the previous day about those movements. And, like, the assistant coach guy notices that, man, this kid has drastically improved in one day. And he knew that Hinata had really good athletic instincts, but now he's noticing that he's trying to, he's starting to think about what he's doing. And he's like, damn, if he puts those instincts together with his thinking, he's going to become very good. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's getting Hinata's. Like like I said, getting really hungry because he's just thinking a lot and he never uses his brain. Um, and then meanwhile, at the All Japan practice, they're playing a game and Kageyama is kind of like playing really awkwardly. Uh, he's getting blocked when he goes up for shots that he'd normally score on. And he sets a ball expecting like someone like Hinata to already be in motion because that was the play that they ran that was so good where... Hinata would be basically watching Kageyama and he would already be running up for the spike before Kageyama even set the ball to where it needed to go. 
And so he tries to do that. And the guys on this all pro team are like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> like the, we didn't, we don't have like telepathy. We can't do that. Uh, so he has to adjust basically is what's happening. Um, so yeah. And the other players on the all prefecture team are, they're starting to take notice that Hanada is taking his bald boy duties so seriously that he's like in the middle of a match or something. And even Tsukishima, who's like super laid back, is kind of annoyed at this. He's like, oh, every, I hate this. When I look at him, I feel like I actually have to play hard. And I hate that. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a pretty great moment at the end of the episode when one of the kids from Shiro Torizawa gives Hinata a thumbs up for his effort. And then Hinata's like, oh my god, I got a thumbs up. And he gives him a thumbs up back. And then a dude spikes a ball like straight into his nuts. Like, bounces off the floor right into his nuts and he crumples down in pain. It was pretty Oh, fun. I know. That was really interesting to me that they put that in there. <laughs> was I was like, good. oh, they went there in Q. Okay. Yeah, they usually don't do that in Q. You're right. And I like how the Shiro Tarasawa coach was like, I told you to keep your eyes on the damn ball, you idiot. <laughs> He's like, yes, I know. And he's like crying. I'm like, oh. It reminds me of uh, baseball practices where people would get hit in the nuts by ground balls and the coach would yell at them for being idiots. And it was great. Dude, I, the, the other players' reactions is what made me laugh about it. Like he got hit in the nuts. So I was like, eh. But then they kept panning from one person to the next. And then I started laughing because oh, I, I was like, all right, that's funny now. Just the silence and the like, look, yeah, it was good. It was good, yeah. It was good. And then, yeah, at the very end of the episode is like Tsukishima pulls Hinata aside to tell him something. And they, they, we don't find out what that is until next episode. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So, like, I, I know there's a little bit of talk about what I would think about this show. And yeah. I do think it is pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. I already said I like how Hinata, like, breaks down the moves of the players. And I think that's pretty interesting. And I also do like volleyball. So that helps. Nice. Uh, and it's also very relieving that these people want to be here and actually play <laughs> the fucking sport. Yeah. Yeah. If you give me a sports anime anime about players whining and not wanting to play, and I just immediately just dismiss it. I'm like, well, then just don't play and go do something else. I'm sorry. I don't want to watch you cry about it the whole time. Yeah, one of the only people who's like that, I mean, there's a couple people in Q, but like Tsukishima, who, you know, is talking to Hinata at the end of the episode, he's kind of like that, but he goes through this whole arc in the, the previous season that he's more into it now than he ever was before, so I'm really okay. curious I mean, what he I has to say. I don't think it's, it's yeah. very whiny. I don't think it's a very, like... No, I don't, that, which is why I like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because yeah. I was like, I don't really think it's like that. Um Haikyuu is one of the best sports anime ever. It's, like, so intense. They get really into the nitty-gritty stuff. I love it. Yeah, we're just building up, and it's going to get very intense this season, I can already tell. So, like, I'm excited. Yeah. The detail. I just, like, I wonder how applicable it is to make that tiny hop. In my brain, that makes sense, because then that automatically puts your body in the movement, mm-hmm. and you're not going to sit there and just freeze as you try to figure out where this ball's coming from, so... Well, you can see that it's like it's not perfect because you have to time it right, or else you're yeah. going to be in midair while the ball's already coming down, and then you're screwed. So, it's mm-hmm. definitely something you have to practice and get experience with. But yeah. <laughs> Speaking of no balls in the air <sighs> this episode, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I know. I'm excited. <laughs> hey, listeners! It's Becom from the future here. There is some confusion in this review of Interspecies Reviewers uh, because Kat was watching a censored version of the episode while Leo and I, the miscreants that we are, watched a completely uncensored version. So when we start disagreeing over what you can and cannot see, just know that Kat was seeing completely different images from what we were seeing, completely censored. So enjoy the confusion. Okay, so... You guys were like, this episode is like a porn. And it, it is. It has so much stuff. Ooh, it's, it's it so is a lewd. Porn. It's, it's like it's extremely lewd. It's extremely blah, blah, blah. lewd. It's not that lewd. There's straight up sex scenes. Okay, no, 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 no. There were scenes where sex was happening where you didn't see anything. 
All right, so this is interspecies reviewers, by the way. <laughs> oh, because it was blurred out, like, all of most of Japanese? No, they had, like, the blackout screen and everything. You didn't see shit. Uh, you see you saw more zero than enough. You, like, see... you saw zero pussy in that in that entire episode. You straight up see a vibrator being inserted into a blurred vagina. <laughs> what the yeah, it's fuck not, are you, you talking about? You see the vibrator. You just know that it is a vibrator. That, that's Japanese porn. What and the you fuck? don't see it being inserted into a vagina. You just know that that's what's happening. No, you from, like, see the it go into a blur. You see a blurry vibrator go into a blurry vagina. Oh my god! Like, okay, my definition of a porn is something that someone would want to jerk off to. <laughs> that's nobody not this. Will, you, <laughs> nobody will want to jerk off to this. There's plenty of you are so, so you fucking crazy? wrong. You're so, so crazy. This is not wrong. lewd enough for people to jerk off to. What are you jerking <laughs> off? I mean, come on. Have you, have you ever heard of this, softcore porn, cat? If you jerk off to this, then you're a fucking loser. God damn All it, right? you just got rid of go, half of our fucking viewer base. Go find a real fucking porn with, like, a, a pussy porn. and a dick and watch it and jerk off. Don't jerk off to this. Well, I mean, that's why I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is, like, straight up hentai. It is, like, as etchy as etchy can go without being a hentai. Basically. It's not a hit side. You guys were like, oh, it's so X-rated. I was like, all right, I guess I'm seeing some like like actual pubic hair and shit. Like, I guess it's going down. Yeah, no, no, you don't see that, but you see everything else but that, and everything else is very heavily implied, yeah. Well, it's heavily implied, but that's not the same as like, and here it is in all its glory. True, yeah, it's a slightly different, which is why it snuck onto TV <laughs> in certain places. <laughs> But then it got taken mm. off of TV. <laughs> everything that was shown was in in service of the plot. There was there was not a lot of gratuitous like here we're going to show you this and we don't have to show you it but but we are going to. A lot of it was just like and this is how they reviewed it and why like th- this is how things should be reviewed. I liked it. Uh, it was good. I mean that's yeah that's guys- fine. I, I wouldn't say anything was like not in service of the plot. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know. You guys are being babies. Like, the way you were talking about it, especially Leo. Leo is in the chat a couple days ago, guys. I'm talking to the audience. I'm, like, <laughs> concluding them in this. So he's like, yeah, man, I had to turn down my volume on my TV, like, so low. I was afraid that my roommates would hear me and they would judge me for listening to this. Okay, my two roommates are 18 He's my second cousin, and if he ever said anything to his mom, who is my cousin, would fucking kick my ass. Uh, <laughs> and, you're and it a was grown spe- ass man. Spe- you can watch porn this in your was, own damn house if you want. Which I'm okay with, but it was the halfling scene. The halfling and scene I'm, is real fucking bad. And I'm like, I hope to God nobody sees me watching this. This is, I feel like I'm committing a crime right now, fucking watching that. That was bad bad it was basically just that part well i mean i I guess she does look a little bit like a kid but (laughs) a little bit a little bit cat just a little bit but but like you know that in the story like yeah like at least she's like a sadist child that makes it a little better (laughs) that makes what the fuck (laughs) it's what she's not being assaulted she's assaulting someone at least that's better it, it makes me feel Oh no, like I mean yeah, okay, that part makes me feel better about the two yeah. children fucking on my screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. You don't fuck the children. The children fuck you. <laughs> Good. Children of the corn. Like children of the dark. porn. It's children of the oh, porn. <laughs> children of the porn. No, that is the name of this episode. <laughs> oh, I don't children know. Of the porn. It's a good title, but I don't no, know if I want that the title. Come on, come on. You know it has to be the title. Well, Let's not even play. I, by popular demand, it may, be, it may end up being the title. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, what was... Uh, I have this note. It's the Phantom Hands from Plunderer. What, am I, what was I talking about? Oh, they about? show up oh. when... Uh, uh, what's her name? Crim, Crim... She tries to well, leave. Well, actually, Crim... Yeah. Is Crim technically a guy... Like I don't know what she, they, she's they refer, in between. refer to her as them. They when yeah. they okay, when so they give I don't know what when they give Krim them a pro- as, pronoun. Yeah. I'm gonna really hard hard try to like say this correctly. Yeah. When the narrator gives them a pronoun, they use they or them. 
Okay. So I'm assuming that they are. They have by. both parts uh, normally, but yeah, they're she stopped has from yeah. going outside. Parts, yeah. But she identifies, he identifies as a male. Okay. He usually identifies as a male, but when the narrator refers to Krim, he says they are them. They are them. I've never seen okay. I've never seen the narrator refer to Krim as anything but they are them. Gotcha. Yeah. And so it's speaking of the Phantom Hands, I'm totally on board as to why they don't let the uh, uh guests leave the premises. Because, I'm on board for oh, the yeah. first reason, which is like, oh, these stupid guys would go to like an onsen or like a girl's locker room and just like watch girls. Like, and that's, I agree with that part. Oh, but but yeah. you're okay with but them you're okay with some the st- guy and like them waking up next to this No, no, that and them part's the like, one that I think is really, uh-huh. that's a really fucked up reason. That's a bad reason to keep them from leaving. Like, yeah, no, that's just like trans panic bullshit. Like, I hate that part of this episode. It's such well, crap. Well, okay, but, but like, I, what I don't. people are doing that? Like, like, what person is going to go do that? Like, I think that's a bullshit okay. made up reason to keep uh, them there. I don't know. Okay. So, like, I agree. Nah, I can see there's where you're too many from. people in the world for that not to happen. I mean, yeah, no, I, can sure, see, I can see where you're coming how from. Common be is calm that? with it. No, I can, you, I can see both sides they of it. They basically got sides. tricked into sleeping with somebody who they, they thought was, they, want was somebody to sleep else. With. Yes. Yes. That's, yeah, that's pretty bad, if you ask me. Yeah, but like, when okay. does that ever happen in real life? No, no, no okay. That's no, not going to no. happen in real life. Exactly. It's, no, 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 no. Because no. <laughs> like, okay. we don't have magic potions that turn you into a fucking opposite gender overnight, Let- Becom. God damn. Okay, but 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 on on Becom side, and I'm on both because I can see both sides. Oh wow, your on ultimate B-com centrist side, cat. <laughs> I, I, on Becom side, there are in real life men who will go home with trans women, mm-hmm. thinking that they're. You know, they have women. a pussy. Yeah. And then when they take off their clothes, when they find out that they have other types of parts, freak out and kill them. Yep. And that's justifiable sometimes in court and they'll get off on it. Yeah. Because, well, you know, you were you were just you were upset. You were tricked. Yeah, now, so I find that to be pretty shitty. This that for that reason specifically. You yeah. show up at my house looking like a sexy woman. I fuck you, and then I wake up the next day, and you're back to you now. I'm gonna be really fucking scarred, <laughs> like badly. Well, yeah, I mean, in this world specifically, where like you can like literally transform. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's a violation because you actually did have sex. That what the situation that actually occurs occurs in real life that Bcom and I are talking about. Yes, I mean you haven't had sex, so. I mean, there there may have been a little like of deceitfulness in them not telling you until they got back to their apartment. Well, but like they haven't they haven't like assaulted I you by fucking. You know what I mean? Read so an article a little while back is a military guy. He did end up killing like a Vietnamese trans sex worker because mm-hmm. of like similar reasons. I think it was like a murder suicide. But yeah, I've yeah. seen this news article before. Yeah. So yeah. so in real life, it's not justifiable because they haven't touched you. Like they haven't. Like had sex with you under false pretenses. They've right. just brought you back to their house, and then you found out about this fact. And freaked so it's, out. It's not yeah. just a, yeah, it's not justifiable. They probably should have told you before they went back to their house, but it's still not right. justifiable. Um, but in this world, where someone would have sex and then wake up and find out, maybe a little bit more justifiable. Yeah, it was just like. Weird to me that someone would even do that. And even in this world, though, like, it's like, why would you want to do that? Why would you trick someone like that? What? what? It seems so weird. I uh, know a gay guy that would love to sleep with me, and I could see him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's actually very plausible I mean, to me. Yeah, maybe they're just, or maybe they just hate you that much. They're like, I'm going to fuck you up forever. They saw Leo's lion mane and they were like, I got to get there. Yeah, they're get like, there. I hate you so much that I'll fuck you so that you're fucked up in the head. Indeed. Interesting. But yeah, so that was an interesting part. I, I actually liked the the whole section on in boys or in you boys. And like rainbow boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rainbow boys. Oh, yeah. That was and, a whole uh, thing, too. That was uh, pretty in depth. Actually. Finisher boys. I definitely know some like finisher boys. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> five or more i know some of those um but yeah no I, that was fun i love how um crim kept going back to them and the rest of them are like why is he so interested in the invoice and i'm like you know why he's interested in the invoice come on <laughs> um 
and they all pick their I don't know. I really liked Krem's choice with the hyena. Who has I liked it the most. Both genitalia, basically. Yes. I, I liked it the most. I thought it was like very suitable to him as a character, first of all. Well, it's a lot like him because he has when he's not drinking magic potions, he has both also. Yes. Um are we just agreeing that we're gonna call Krim a him? Because he does. I mean, you can uh, see how they identify. continue to refer to Krim and for the rest of the episodes. But I'm going to say yeah. him because that's how he refers. Uh, he to refers himself. To himself as him. It's at least at some point I remember. So yeah, yeah. he yeah. seems to he seems to think of himself as a yeah. guy. So we're gonna yeah. So we're that's why go I go with, with that. him. If we're corrected, it, we'll be corrected and we'll figure it out. Yeah. It's fine. Um. So yeah, I really liked his choice of that. Like, I thought it was very appropriate, very fitting for him as a character. I thought he probably had the best experience of any of them because he wasn't afraid to be like yeah i'm getting fucked like (laughs) so the fuck what i appreciated that the rest of these people are pussies like literally (laughs) they're too scared to get get fucked in the pussy when they had one (laughs) i I appreciated krim i was like yes you know what? You're not afraid. Well, I like. Well, it. I think the, the Zell, elf elf Zell had a really good Zell time. Zell got fucked. Yeah, yeah Zell <laughs> well, got but slimed. Like by slime, but not not by a dick though. But I guess like there there's enough in there. There's that enough it feels structure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely goes deep enough for that. <laughs> Ooh, it goes deep. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> Zell, Zell's scene was interesting. I was like, all right, all right, this is fun. Um, I, I feel like. G- I don't know, Stunk kind of got, like, the worst end of the bargain because it's just like, well, you got fucked by this elf that you've already gotten fucked by. <laughs> Didn't seem that that interesting. Yeah. Eh, Were you yeah. guys bored by that? It was the, of all the scenes, it was the least, like, from, for, any, for whatever reason, like, interesting one. Like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was the, the then, wettest one, but uh, the least interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then, then the the halfling scene was interesting. I I liked the part where they had, there was like a little dom action going on. I was like, yeah, pain and pleasure. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts. Oh, God. But but it oh, was. But it's a child. Oh my God! I hate that scene was, so much. Oh, it, I hate it. I, okay, but like. You could say that in this universe <sighs> they're halflings, but I also understand. That yeah, that's yeah. some bullshit people use to construct some fucked up scenes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. basically. Okay. And okay. So, then we're we're yeah. on the same page at least, kind of. Yes. Like, okay. Yes. We're on the same page. <sighs> so <laughs> overall, I really liked the episode. I thought it was really fun. I thought you guys were being babies, acting like this was like the worst, most R-rated thing you'd ever seen in your life. I'm pretty sure all of you have seen worse. All of you had have had brains show you that picture with the girl's fist up the other girl's ass <laughs> all the way to her elbow. I know he's shown you that. So you guys have seen worse than this. Don't even pretend you haven't. Okay, can I can I give the update on the uh, the networks that have canceled the show? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> so uh, on February eighteenth, a couple days before we're recording, um, another Japanese TV network, Sun TV and Kobe, uh, canceled the show. That's so that's following up on Tokyo MX that canceled it, and of course, like Funimation canceled it. But so at this point, there's still like a couple of networks that are showing. It's like ATX, KBS Kyoto, and BS Eleven in Japan are all showing it. Uh, Anime Lab in Australia and New Zealand is still streaming it. Uh, and Wakanim is streaming it in parts of Europe, though they canceled it in like the Nordic countries, like Sweden and Norway and stuff. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. So they're dropping like flies. Like, I'm so curious, like, by the end of this show, is it going to be down to like one TV network and like one streaming service? I, it would be so funny of me if they like, just keep canceling it after this point. But. I mean, it's not going to get much worse, right? It's it's so funny that, like, you know, everybody, you know, you would assume everybody at these networks did their research. They went and read the manga, which is what it's sourced from. Yeah. And they went, all right, this is barely acceptable. We yeah. can get away with this. Yeah. And then the director came in and the shows started airing and they were like, ah, uh, this is a, a lot different than the manga. Uh <laughs> I'm uh, pretty much sure we crossed the line that we were looking for. So, ugh. I like yeah. there was like a little quote about like why some TV dropped, it and they're just like, "We've dropped the show for organizational reasons." 
It's just like, oh, that, that, very interesting. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, why can't they just say, uh, this changed <laughs> drastically from the source material and is not what we originally thought it was, so we have to take it off the uh, Well, it's Japan, so nobody wants to throw anybody under the bus because that would be uh, very impolite to do. <laughs> so, yeah, basically. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, Anything else, guys? Uh, I think that's it. No, I think that's it for this week. I'm excited to see more of interspecies reviewers. I think it's hilarious. I think it's fun and refreshing. And I think people are babies. Oh, it's a and fun discussion to, for sure. <laughs> they, they need to accept that sexuality is a thing and it can be funny and it can be fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you, listeners, for uh, listening. Remember to like, follow, subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on new podcasts and videos. You can also find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And follow us on Twitter at Nerdum and Other for updates as well. Definitely, definitely come hang out with us on Discord. We have a bunch of fun chats there. Cat never talks, but Bcom and I almost always answer back pretty quickly, <laughs> usually. And with all that, we'll see you next time. See you later. Yeah, bye.